Warhammer 40k lore is amazing, but it's also kind of weird. I'm not talking about how it's incredibly unique. Some of its themes would terrify a lot of popular culture. I'm talking about how even just accessing the lore is kind of strange. The return of Rabute Gilliman to the setting of Warhammer 40,000 was perhaps the single largest event we have ever had, not now. But if you want to read about his revival, you need to get your hands on a campaign supplement for the game from six years ago. That's kind of like if you wanted to read about how the Emperor from Star Wars survived this, you had to buy a campaign book for Star Wars Shatterpoint because only in the book's lore was this explained. Another pathway to abilities that some would consider unnatural is of course the Tau Empire, and Commander Farsight does have a series of novels that cover his journey. The final book, Empire of Lies, ends as you can imagine with him becoming disillusioned with the Tau Empire and he goes into exile. But Sandman, you handsome bastard, you say. Commander Farsight isn't in exile. I've seen his model. I've seen his big, blue, beautiful face on the front of the Arcs of Omen Farsight book. How and when did he come out of exile? Well, if you want the details on this, you need the Farsight Enclave supplement from 6th edition. For context, we are currently on the 10th edition of the game, and it gets weirder. If you are a fan of Lionel Johnson, you probably want to know what did he actually say to his sons when he made it back to the rock, the other rock. Well, good news, they have written about this, and so I'm sure, of course, you have the relevant White Dwarf magazine. Now, I'm not saying that this is necessarily problematic. Most of us are pretty used to it at this point. And as a marketing ploy to get us to buy models, it does work pretty well. But objectively, it's kind of strange that people who are into the lore have to buy books for a game that they don't play to keep up with major plot points at times. This format of lore also has some hilarious consequences and today we're going to look at that through two characters who are monumentally powerful but you've probably never heard of them. However, before we can get to them, the sponsor for today's video is Bloodline Heroes of Lithas. Yes, it's got amazing graphics, it's got a unique gotcha system, it's got interesting storylines, but it has a twist and when I first heard about it, my initial reaction was, is that even possible? Can they even do this? And boy oh boy did they pull this off. The game is actually free to download and there's a link in my description or you can scan the QR code on the screen now. Through the system of marrying bloodlines, you can create over a thousand fantasy hybrids, so you essentially have endless possibilities for your lineups and strategies. Deploy your team of hybrids into a vast and realistic fantasy world. Hybrids inherit not only the talents and traits of their parents, but also their unique appearances passed down from each family tree and fused into one. New fantasy characters with unique abilities for each gender are released every two weeks. The Goat Folk Stone Throwers just came out. They originated from the lands of the Dragonborn and became the finest marksmen after finding an ancient artifact of power in the ruins of a lost civilization. If you want to check out the game for free on Android or iOS, there's a link in my description or scan the QR code on the screen now. This will also get you a starter pack worth $20. It includes 100,000 gold, 100 diamonds, and a summoning crystal. The first 30 players who leave their in-game account ID and username in the first pinned comment section below will receive a legendary female orc champion, Urgril, one of the best warriors to carry you into the game. For the first character we're going to look at today, I would be very surprised if you've ever heard its tale in full. The Cacodominus and the Catalexis Heresy is clearly a thought-out storyline 
But that storyline was cut up, and sections of it were spread across various codexes and various editions of the game. However, that is where I come in. I've gone through all of the books for all related factions and have pulled together every piece of lore that I could find. So, enjoy this tale. An Adeptus Mechanicus exploratory fleet, delving into regions of the galaxy unclaimed by the Imperium of Man, stumbles upon the power of the Cacodominus, an alien cyborg of colossal psychic potential. The entire fleet, en masse, is unable to fell this beast. The Xenos doesn't just slaughter those that it meets, it studies them, it investigates humanity, it learns of our cultures, our technological capabilities, our agents, and of course, our weaknesses. Soon after, the Cacodominus encounters another force within our galaxy. It discovers 17 Dreadblades. They are piloted by fallen nobles who have forsworn their allegiance to the Imperium to pursue their own murderous desires and visions of conquest. The term Dreadblade is used by the Ordo Hereticus to describe those knights who serve no one, yet through its psychic abilities they all come to serve one master, the Cacodominus. To each of its loyal knights, it charges them with a vital mission. These are necessary for its plans to come to fruition. One took a quest to find a sunless planet on which an ancient technological marvel is buried. One is sent to find and butcher every single member of the Xenos race known as the Axlo and one is sent to protect the time stream from the Zechian demon Kairos Fateweaver. It seems this monster is even aware of the machinations of Zech, the god of change. Meanwhile, the Cacodominus itself conquers hundreds of systems. Within a year of it encountering the Imperium, it controls the populace of 1300 planetary systems. This heresy cannot be ignored. The beast must be executed. And for this task, a mighty force is sent. It consists of the Legio Cybernetica and the Black Templars. The automatons of the Legio Cybernetica are counted amongst the mightiest servants of the Machine God. Their towering robots stride forward, volleys of white-hot phosphor burning death into the servants of the Xenos, their power fists mauling anything within reach. Controlled by the Cybernetica datasmiths, they will prosecute their Doctrina protocol until they run out of power, and so are protected against the psychic influence of the Xenos. Hot burns the hatred of the Black Templars for the Witch, and Bright blazes their faith in the immortal Emperor of Mankind. With fervent prayers do they shrug off even the most grievous of wounds, and perhaps it even granted them a unique resilience to the Cacodominus out of all of the Astartes. Certainly, it appeared that the God Emperor was watching over them that day, for the concerted attack of these two factions brought the beast down. The Catalexis heresy may have been over, but the Cacodominus was not done causing harm for the Imperium. Alas, its psychic death scream echoed and amplified through the warp burning out the minds of a billion astropaths and distorting the signal of the Astronomicon. Without this guiding light, millions upon millions of ships are lost in the resulting upheaval and entire subsectors slide into barbarism without the light of the Emperor or the dictates of the Adeptus Terra to guide them. It is known as the Howling, and it would take a long time for the Imperium to regain the strength that it had lost. Also curious, the Dreadblades made no attempt to seek revenge. 
Each one had been commanded to complete a singular task, and the death of their lord is of little concern so long as the will of the Cacodominus is eventually fulfilled. It appears that the Black Templars did not escape this unscathed either. There are multiple theories as to why the Black Templars do not employ librarians. Some say it is at the command of the God Emperor himself, for it is true that during the Great Crusade, the Emperor passed the Edict of Nicaea, ensuring that all legions would no longer employ librarians. And so the Templars still take this edict as holy law. However, their gene sire, the great Rogaldorn, reapproved them during the Siege of Terror and saw no fury from the master of mankind. Some say that it is merely because of their vows. Abhor the witch, destroy the witch, they say. And so perhaps it is really that simple. Nevertheless, there is another theory. It is rumored that the Black Templars continued to field librarians up until the Howling, when the death scream of this creature resulted in a deterioration within the Black Templars' gene seed, and so no more would they be able to field Psyker Battle Brothers. These stalwart Astartes have accepted this, believing that it is part of the Emperor's divine plan. If this is true, today, even within the chapter, very few would be aware of this secret. It remains a mystery as to what manner of alien horror the Cacodominus truly was. All that the Black Templars have left of its entire race is a single skull, or so they claim. The skull of the creature is now a relic of the chapter that they sometimes even carry into battle. And ever, it echoes with its howling death screams. Covert investigations by the Ordo Xenos continue, but they court the wrath of Sigismund's successors. Often, Games Workshop and Black Library don't like to outright say how or why a thing has happened. So for example, in the current setting of Warhammer 40k, the Milky Way galaxy is split into two by a series of warp storms called the Great Rift or the Cicatrix Maledictum. This has created numerous problems for the Imperium. Now, assuming that you live in the Milky Way galaxy, you will know that there isn't actually a series of warp storms splitting the galaxy into two. However, Abaddon the Despoiler happened. He launched 13 Black Crusades that had various objectives, including the destruction of planets with Necron pylons or other constructs on, and then he ultimately destroyed the planet, Cadia. Not long after this, another warp rift, the Eye of Terror, kind of spilled out across the galaxy. The theory that most characters have in the setting is pretty simple. These planets sort of kept the Eye of Terror in check, and then when they were destroyed, along with some other shenanigans going on at the time, the Great Rift sprang up. However, even to this day, Games Workshop doesn't technically commit to this idea. It's just said to be a theory within the setting. A lot of the time, this kind of attitude is good, as players can add in their own lore, but it also doesn't back any future writers into corners. If they want to give a new reason in the future, they can. Perhaps the Emperor sneezed, and the Great Rift was born. I believe that the Cacodominus essentially has a similar origin. Its original purpose was to explain why are there no librarians within the Black Templars, but they have not committed to this idea. So if they want to create another narrative in the future, they can always say, oh, well that whole Cacodominus thing was just a wild coincidence. This next story highlights another issue that we sometimes get with Warhammer 40k lore. Games Workshop is a company and sometimes it operates with other companies and licenses out parts of its IP. However, the products that they make sometimes get discontinued, and it seems that the law within these products can be forgotten about. 
The lore of the Death Watch role-playing game is a pretty good example here, as the lore of the Sue Bekar dynasty was popular at the time, but it's been about 10 years and I don't think they've been mentioned in any other Necron lore books or novels, and so the amazing character of Armantek appears to have been forgotten about, and damn, does he have some interesting lore. They call him the Crimson Scythe, and what a war scythe he wields. Some Eldar mystics still sing of one of his conquests, when he rendered the planet Maldek into billions of pieces with just a single blow. The once and future king of the Su Bekar dynasty, Theron Armantek was considered to be one of the most powerful warriors out of the entire Necron Empire. Such was his might that he fought at the side of the Catan themselves. As the war in heaven raged, Armantek became a legendary figure, his accomplishments remarkable. He laid waste to vast tracts of the webway and defeated beings revered by the ancient Eldar as gods. Even in the present era, some Eldar are sworn never to rest until he is hunted down. They stand in eternal vigil over any region that they believe might harbour the Star Slayer's secret resting place. To ensure his awakening, he made contingencies that would draw the Eldar far away from his resting place. That resting place being the Hollow Sun. A marvel of arcane super science, the likes of which has not been seen in the galaxy for countless millions of years. Armantek shared the grief of Zarek, the Silent King, for the Necrons paid a terrible price for their immortality, their souls and their flesh and blood bodies. Therefore, though few know it, not only did Armantek set in motion a plan to devastate the enemies of his people, he also had a plan to regain that which his people have lost. But any hopes for that salvation may be gone. For during the war in heaven, Armantek's legion suffered greatly, and his ever eager rival and cousin, Seti of the Charnavok dynasty, destroyed the Eldar holding the Great Ring, stealing the glory that was by right the Crimson Scythes. When at last Armantek's host carried the day and scoured the halls of that meddlesome race, he confronted his cousin furious at this breach in martial protocol. Seti dismissed Armantek's complaint, but Armantek could not forgive or forget. However, the opportunity for the Pharaon's vengeance never came. For later, the Silent King set in motion his plan for the Great Sleep, and Armantek was forced to set his bitterness aside. But it would not lie. Such was his hatred for the rivaling Charnavok dynasty that this sliver of hate that the Pharaon bore inside his consciousness refused to slumber with him in his stasis casket. And 60 million years later, that seed of bitterness had grown until it consumed him. The Pharaon was now crippled in mind. The Charnavok dynasty was awakened first it was attacked by another Xenos race. When the Hollow Sun detected a plea for aid from the rival dynasty, the control program attempted to awaken Armantek. Sixty million years of distilled bitterness for the sender of this message burst through layer upon layer of failsafe protocols, and the feedback surged unchecked through the entire system. Countless thousands of slumbering Necrons had their cortexes blasted by Armantek's rage. Many were turned into mindless shells. The Crown World's backup protocol was enacted before it was overwhelmed. Even as it perished, the program sealed off the Pharaon stasis crypt and selected a regent who would rule in his stead, Overlord Regent Ahotek. He awakened the venerable cryptic Ozcan the Codifier. Ozcan has ever served and been loyal to the Subekar dynasty, 
Such was his loyalty that despite the fact that he saw through the lies of the Catan and warned his pharaoh of the Silent King's error, at the bequest of his lord he still entered the bio furnace. The overlord regent has tasked Ozcan with attending to the blasted pharaoh. Ozcan has brought many within the legions to heal, but Ahotek seeks the dynasty's command protocols within the pharaoh's shattered mind. Thereafter, a full awakening could begin. Within his consciousness, however, lurks more secrets. The dark visions that have thus far been rendered hint that the Crimson Scythe was blessed with terrible knowledge of the future. Ozcan has thus far kept what he has seen to himself, as have those other cryptex attending to their lost pharaoh, for none know whether these visions are true. Ozcan still fears that the pharaoh has fallen prey to the dreaded flayer virus, and the necrons could unleash untold evils upon the galaxy should they disinter an accursed flayer king. Under the pretense of carrying out the regent's orders, the Cryptech has covertly been working on a project to transfer a Necron consciousness into a physical body made of flesh and bone. When that happens, the venerable Cryptech hopes that the process of reawakening the Pharaoh of the Subeka dynasty can begin. Through extensive research and secret experiments, the Cryptech has determined that only a body as resilient and durable as a Necron's living metal frame would be suitable for such a reawakening. After numerous attempts with various species, Ozcan has identified the ideal body for this purpose, an Adeptus Astartes. I think these two pieces of lore are so cool and I think it's such a shame that they have not been expanded upon or revisited. Let me know what you thought of this lore, how do you reckon they would fare against some of the other big names in the galaxy? The Emperor now? Certainly not. But the Emperor before Molek? Maybe. Yes, the undoing of the Cacodominus was essentially a bunch of angry boys and some toasters, and yes, the undoing of the Crimson Scythe was essentially his inability to process his feelings. But Malkador was a monster, we can all agree, and he was killed, as we know, by furniture. So don't judge. When we look at the actual feats of these characters, these beings are so monumentally powerful that quite frankly this is some of the most over the top Warhammer 40k lore I've ever heard. 1300 planetary systems and a hollow sun, even for 40k, that's a lot. So I do think there is a chance that GW will expand on these storylines in the future, and you can make that happen, and hey, it helps me out also. So just like, comment, and subscribe, all of that good stuff, and if this video gets big enough, well hey, they can't ignore us all, right?